Welcome back to the Bible, Day 35, The Essence of Leadership. Leadership is adaptable, encompassing integrity, humility, service, wisdom, and understanding. We explore these fundamental characteristics that define effective leadership by drawing inspiration from Psalms chapter 18, verses 25 through 36, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 39, and Job chapters 33 through 34. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to ask the Lord. And now we're going to ask the Lord to shine into our hearts of loving Master, to pure light your divine knowledge, and open up the eyes of our mind that we may understand your teachings and scripture. Help us to apply what we learn after having conquered several desires. We may pursue a spiritual way of life, thanking and doing all the things that are pleasing to you. Through Christ, our God, your light, to you we give glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sages, amen. Or as a shepherd, I good evening. Welcome back. So great is his faithfulness. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep asking, seeking, keep knocking. Christ is truly in our midst. The true definition of minister is to serve someone else's will. My pleasure to bring you all God's word each and every day. For it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, so first reading from Out of Wisdom, Psalms chapter 18, verses 25 through 36. We're going to talk about the care. We're going to talk about the different char characteristics of leadership out of Psalms chapter 18, verses 25 through 36. After our reading, get our screen shared over. Thank you all again for following. So Psalms 18, verse 25 through 36, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it says, to the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble. But bring low those whose eyes are haughty. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against the truth. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like a feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield. And your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide the broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give away. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So the first quality of leadership found right here in Psalms 18, verses 25 through 36, confidence. Look at verse 29. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can seal a wall. Leaders exhibit what confidence, right? So leaders exhibit confidence in their abilities, knowing they can overcome obstacles and, and succeed with what divine assistance. This verse also emphasizes reliance on what God's strength, illustrating the importance of faith and self-assurance when in leadership. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Second quality, protection. Verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. So leaders provide protection and refuge for those under their care. This mirrors God's role as a shield for his people. This verse also underscores the importance of creating a safe and secure environment for followers, fostering trust and loyalty. Third quality, strength. Look at verse 32. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. Beautiful. So leaders draw strength from God, right? Recognizing what their dependence on divine empowerment rather than relying solely what on their abilities. Right? This verse highlights the humility of infantile leaders, right? Of great leaders. Acknowledging that true strength comes from a higher source. Beautiful. Fourth quality, training. Verse 34. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. Beautiful. So leaders undergo training and preparation to equip themselves for what? Their challenges. 
just as warriors prepare for battle. Some of you may have served in the army, just like me. Right? Go through training, right? This verse amplifies the importance of continuous learning and development leadership, honing skills and abilities for what? Greater effectiveness. Beautiful. Fifth quality, guidance. Look at verse 36. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. So guidance. Leaders see guidance from God to navigate what? The complexities or hardships of their roles. Trusting in divine direction to lead them along the right path. The verse underscores the need for leaders to remain what grounded in their faith and seek wisdom and guidance from spiritual sources. So in the Psalms we read, or in these passages, we find teachings on confidence, what protection, strength, training, and guidance, all essential characteristics of effective leadership. As leaders emulate these qualities, they can aspire and empower those under their care to reach their full potential and achieve shared goals. Beautiful. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, leadership. Beautiful. Our New Testament reading, Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 39. A warning against hypocrisy. It's zoomed in. Name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus said to the crowds and disciples, the teachers of the law, the teachers of the law and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do every, everything they tell you. Do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and, and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted and, and they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted seven woes on the teachers of the law and the pharisees woe to you teachers of the law and pharisees you hypocrites you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces you yourselves do not enter nor will you let those enter who are trying to woe to you teachers of the law pharisees you hypocrites you travel over over land and sea to win a single convert and when you have succeeded you make them twice as much a child of hell you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it. And by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it. And by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne. And by the one sits on it. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you, you strain out the gnat, the swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like wash you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead 
and everything I clean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you blind tombs for the prophets. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding in the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, and the blood of righteous of Abel to the blood of Zechariah and Berkiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you, you all, this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent to you? How often I have longed to gather you, gather your children together as hands, as a hand gathers her chicks under her wings. And you're and you were not willing. Look at your house, it's left to you desolate. For I tell you, you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's go back. So the the first quality of leadership found in Matthew 23. Character and integrity. In verse 3, it says, So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. True leaders exhibit character and integrity by aligning their actions with their teachings. The verse also highlights the importance of consistency and authenticity in leadership. As leaders, what? As leaders, are supposed to lead by example. Right? That's the whole point. Number two, authenticity. Let's look at verse five. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their flatteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. So authentic leaders do not seek validation or recognition for their actions, but act sincerely and be genuine. And the verse warns against su superficial displays of righteousness and provides the need for leaders to act from a place of authenticity and, and genuine concern for others. That makes sense. Number three, humility. Humility, verses 11 through 12. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So humility is a hallmark, right? So humility is a hallmark of, <clears throat> of effective leadership. As leaders prioritize the needs of others above their own, right? So what does that mean, right? Sometimes it means maybe eating less, right? Even maybe in a church setting, allowing others to go ahead and eat in your mind. You know, it's always putting others for yourself, selfless service. So it's just a mark of a true leadership. So this teaching emphasizes the conflicting nature of leadership, where true greatness is found in serving others, right? Humbly. Number four, compassion. So compassion, let's look at verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. So leaders demonstrate what compassion and empathy towards those they lead, even in the face of what rejection or resistance. Jesus was being rejected, but still, it still shows compassion. You know, Jesus tried to save the Pharisees. I think a lot of people sometimes miss that when they read, that he tried to save the Pharisees. He had compassion on them, and he tried to save them. They just weren't willing to listen. So this verse portrays Jesus' heartfelt compassion for the people of Jerusalem, illustrating the depth of empathy leaders should have toward their, their followers. The Pharisees had no compassion on the people. They required more of the people than God did. If that makes sense. So number five, vision and focus. Verse 23. 
right here. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have, you have neglected the most important matters of law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Beautiful. Beautiful. So effective leaders maintain what a clear vision of focus, right? On what truly matters, prioritizing justice, mercy, and faithfulness, and faithfulness principles. The verse, right, admonishes leaders to avoid getting bogged down in trivial matters and to remain steadfast in pursuing righteousness and moral integrity. Okay. Number six, generosity. So generosity, right there, verse 23, right? You should have practiced the latter without, without neglecting the former, right? So true leaders are generous in their actions and attitudes, balancing adherence to the rules with the spirit of generosity and compassion. This verse also encourages leaders to embrace a holistic approach to leadership, encompassing both adherence to principles and a generous spirit towards others. So Matthew chapter 23, we find teaching on, on character, integrity, authenticity, humility, compassion, vision, focus, and generosity. All, is, all these essential characteristics of effective leadership. As leaders embody these qualities, they can inspire and empower those under their care to flourish and thrive. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Great study. All right, so here we go. Job. To our boy Job. Job chapter 33 through 34. So, how we left off, right? Elihu, right? He came on pretty strong, right? But with how we ended that, right? How he came on strong. But we're going to see Elihu. We're going to see him kind of fizzle out. He's going to kind of be like Job's three other friends. Let's jump into this. So, Job chapter 33. But now, Job, listen to my words pay attention to everything i say i'm about to open my mouth my words are on the tip of my tongue my words come from an upright heart my lips sincerely speak what i know the spirit of god has made me the breath of the almighty gives me life answer me then if you can stand up and argue your case before me i'm the same as you in god's sight i too am a piece of clay no fear of me should alarm you nor should my hand be heavy on you but you have said in my hearing, I've heard these very words. I'm pure, I have done no wrong. I'm clean and free from sin. Yet God has found fault with me, considers me an enemy. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch on all my past. But I tell you in this, you are not right. For God is greater than any mortal. Why do you complain to him that he responds to no one's words? For God does speak now one for God does speak now one way, now another. Though no one perceives it in a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them in warnings, to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride, to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Or someone may be fashioned on the bed of pain with constant distress in their bones, so that their body finds Impulsive, and their soul loathes, loathes the choices meal. Their flesh, their flesh wastes away to nothing, and their and their bones, once hidden, now stick out. They draw near to the pit, and their and, and their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, "Spare them from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for them." Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then, then that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being. And they will go to others and say, I have sinned. I have perverted what is right. But I did not get what I deserved. God, God has delivered me from going down to the pit. And I shall live to enjoy the light of life. God does all, all these things to a person twice, even three times, to turn back from the pit. The light of life may shine on them. Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. 
If you have anything to say, answer me, speak up, for I want to vindicate you. But if not, then listen to me, be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Job chapter 34. Then Elihu says, Hear my words, you wise men, listen to me. You men of learning, for the ear tests words as the tongue tastes food. Let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. Job says I'm innocent, but God denies me justice. Although I'm right, I'm considered a liar. Although I'm guiltless, an arrow flicks my incurable wound. Is there anyone like Job who drinks scorn like water? He keeps company with evildoers. He associates with the wicked, for he says there's no proof in trying to please God. So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil. When the Almighty do wrong, he repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It's unthankful that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice, who appointed him over the earth, who put him in charge of the whole earth, if, if it were his intention. And he withdrew his spirit and breath. All humanity would perish together, and mankind would return to dust. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Come someone who hates, who hates justice governed. Will you condemn the just and mighty one? Is it he not the one who says to the kings, you are worthless, and to nobles, you are wicked, who shows no partiality to princes, and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. They die in an instant in the middle of the night. The people are shaken when they pass away. The mighty are removed without human hand. His eyes, on, his eyes are on the ways of the mortals. He sees their every step. There's no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. God has no need to examine people further that they should not come before him for judgment. Without inquiry, he shatters the mighty and sets up others in their place. Because he takes note of their deeds, he overthrows them in the night and they are crushed. He pushes them, he punishes them for their wickedness where everyone can see them. Because they turn, because they turn from following him, he had no regard for any of his ways. They, call, they caused the cry of the poor to come before him. So that he heard the cry of the needy. But if he remains silent, who can condemn him? If he rides his face, who can see him? Yet he is he is over an individual and nation alike. To keep the godless from ruling, from laying snares at the people. Suppose someone says to God, I'm guilty, but I will offend you no more. Teach me what I cannot see if I have done wrong. I will shout to do so again, should God then reward you on your terms. When you refer when you refuse to repent, you must decide. Not I. So tell me what you know. Men of understanding declare wise men who hear me say, who hear me say to me, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. Oh, that Job might be tested to the utmost for answering like a wicked man. To his sin, he has rebellion. Scornfully, he claps his hands among us. He multiplies his words against God. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go back to the beginning. So Job 33. So we started out, right? Elihu presents himself what is a wise counselor to Job. But upon closer examination, right, his words reveal elements of arrogance and deception. Let's break this down. So the arrogance of Elihu. Elihu claims to speak on the behalf of God with great confidence, asserting his what, that he's superior over Job and the other friends, right? That was right there in verses one through seven. Beautiful. He portrays himself as what is more righteous and wise and wiser than Job, suggesting that Job's suffering results from what his, his own sinfulness, right? That was in verses eight through 12. Beautiful. Number two, the deception of Elihu. Elihu misinterprets Job's words and accuses him of just, accuses him of justifying himself rather than God. Verses 12 through 13. Right there. He presents a simplistic he presents simplistic explanations for suffering, attributing it solely to God's desire to bring about repentance. This is 15 through 20. Elihu suggests that Job's complaints are arrogant and that he should humble himself before God. That was in verses 31 through 33. Right there. Psalms 
spiritual teachings on leadership from Job. Leadership should be grounded in humility, right? And compassion, not arrogance and self-righteousness. Jesus exemplified servant leadership, washing his disciples' feet. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, beautiful. True spiritual leadership involves understanding and empathy rather than quick judgments and condemning people. Paul encourages leaders to be patient, gentle, and humble. Gentle and humble. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. Job's friends in Elihu failed to provide what genuine comfort and guidance because they lacked humility and empathy. And Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 reminds us that pride leads to disgrace, but humility leads to wisdom. Right here. So Job chapter 34, all right, verses 1 through 3. Elihu was not, so he was not preaching to make others wiser. Instead, the sin of his preaching was his pride in showing his superior wisdom, trying to make himself seem more righteous than Job. In Job chapter 32, verses 21 through 22, Elihu said, I will show no partiality, nor will I flatter anyone. For if I were skilled in flattery, my maker will soon take me away. So Elihu started out strong, but in the end, his arrogance and prideful behaviors got the best of him. And in the end, he sided with redistribution theology, just like Job's three previous friends. Elihu twists the words of Job, right? He does it again in verses five through eight. So he 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 missed it. He, so he twists the words of Job again in verses five through eight. This was Elihu's attempt to strengthen his argument. I called the, okay. So Elihu, so he twists the words of Job. Right? So he did it again right there. And Job chapter 34, verses 5 through 8. This was Elihu's attempt to strengthen his argument, right? When people do this, I call this like word scrabble. When when individuals twist your words, it can also be what highly deceptive to do this to anyone. So be careful. Make sure we're not doing that, right? We also see the nastiness of Elihu in verse 37. Okay, so in verse 37, it says, to his sin, he adds rebellion. Sportfully, he claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. So here's the nastiness of Elihu. He accused Job of having deserved what his scourge, right? So he's saying he deserves his scourges. And for having sin after the scourges. So he's saying Job deserves everything that's happening to him. So in summary, Elihu's discourse in Job in chapters 33 to 34, reveals his arrogance and deception and shows his true colors what, as a false teacher who was a wolf appearing when in sheep's clothing. Still, Elihu's sins highlight a bigger picture of the importance of humility and empathy and spiritual leadership qualities that Elihu failed to demonstrate to Job. And that's how we're going to end. Thank you all again. Apologize for the dogs barking. So right, we got through that kind of, kind of knocked me off, but we got through it. So, all right, all right, there we go. All right, so let's get our blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sages. Amen. The Lord is our shepherd. We depart in peace. Name the Lord, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Peace be with you all. Go in peace. Shalom, shalom. May the Lord forgive those who love us and those who hate us. Thank you all again. See you all tomorrow, day 36. Hope you, hope you all enjoy day 35. Right? The essence of leadership. Love you all so much. I love you all so much. <laughs>